Hey, composing gloves here, and this is gonna be a simple video that's gonna blow your brain in half. That's my goal, right? Have a simple video that you get, but still blows your brain apart. So it is on sine waves and amplitude. May not sound that exciting at first, but it is actually something that is horribly, horribly lacking in today's music education because it is responsible for so much of what you're listening to so let's talk about how this why how could such a simple concept be so impactful so first off i'm going to call you on it you have never heard a sine wave ever you've never heard a real sine wave one that's actually a sine wave now how can i claim such a thing the answer is in the volume knob so audio engineers are very concerned with coloring of their signal. Digital audio engineers are very concerned with any signal that gets in their bandwidth because they need to encode it so that they can accurately represent it in their digital audio system. So you can play with it as a digital audio engineer inside FL Studio or Pro Tools or Ableton or something. So what you need to do is you need to encode this signal so if there's any signal that you don't know about, you are very concerned. So you're studying sine waves one day, and so all of a sudden you come across this interesting phenomena. A sine wave you're reading in your digital audio book says it never stops, I mean it never begins, and it never ends, So it, or it never stops. So you might be saying, what? Now, then you start thinking about it. You're like, okay, well let me think of a sine wave. Let's take like A440. By definition... A440 must be a sine wave because it is a single frequency that oscillates at 440 beats per second. So, or cycles per second. And so this means that if it ever changes from that, that it's no longer a sine wave. There's additional frequency components and a sine wave by definition is a single frequency component. So you're thinking about this definition and then you're like, well, okay, why would it change? The answer lies in the volume knob. So the volume knob is the, is the problem here. If I were to take this sine wave and play it, check this out. And oh, it's, it's aliasing right now too, so that doesn't help my case. But There's actually a pitch change happening there. If you listen really closely, now I've got a wobble deal going on here. So let me, it's gotta happen relatively quickly though. As I just hit it though, just listen to the note as I hit it. You hear it go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, I am emphasizing it, but you should tune in on it. No pun intended. Just listen to them. You can hear it go, whoa, whoa. And why is that? Why is there a subtle pitch change? Granted, it's a very small pitch change. This, this stacks up as we get going here, though. Well, they, the reason is... And the reason you've never heard one is because when you change the amplitude, the, the slope must get steeper. So let me, there's a, let me open up something real quick here that will allow me to engage you in this process. So this is called Snippet. It's a cool window tool. Okay, so here is a picture of the screen. And... Here we've got our sine wave, right? And it's going up and down and up. Well, in order for it to do this, it's got to stay at this rate forever. Otherwise, you're adding frequency components. Because think about it. In order for it to get to something like this, a louder version of itself, and now this isn't the best strong in the world, but whatever. This slope has got to increase. It's got to go, it's got to increase up faster than this slope and when, once it reaches this achievement that amplitude it can then rest at that pitch and oscillate at that cycle but why it's changing why the volume is being pushed up or pushed down higher frequency content must be introduced now you may have never you may not be familiar with how to interpret high frequency content in, in uh, transverse waves this is a transverse wave this guy right here, because it's a representation of a wave, it's not the actual wave. The actual wave is coming out like this, like sound bubbles, si actual sine waves. This isn't an actual sine wave. So let's talk about that. So if I had a sine wave, la la la, there's my sine wave. And then I had a wave that looks like this. So you can see here, that's the wave I was kind of going for or whatever. Whatever, you see the sine wave. And so you might be asking, what is all this stuff, all these squiggly lines? Well, that is only possible, these shapes, given the fact that it looks ridiculous, is only possible by higher frequency content. If it's uh, otherwise, it can't do that. It's the basic 
digital audio theory. It's the Nyquist theorem. The two points is sufficient to create it. So a point here and a point here would be sufficient to create a low frequency. My All the discrepancies in my signal, like the little bend I have right here, is representing high frequency information. It's been encoded. Because remember, this signal is the representation of all the signals in there summed together. If we were to break this apart, you would see little signals in there. So let's so the point is when you increase the amplitude, you have to change the slope that this thing is at. Therefore, which is just a fancy way of saying the rate of change. We're not I guess that's not the rate of change. Anyways, you're changing the trajectory. I don't know all the fancy math terms for this, okay? I'm sorry if I'm saying wrong terms here, but I'm doing the best I can. So, anyways, this has to change and the rate at which it changes changes. So that therefore changes um the pitch. It's that simple. Now, that's a fancy way of saying it all, but how does this matter to you as an engineer? Well, we just discovered that that's an issue. Well, we could take away a couple things. First off, obviously, lower waves are going to be less susceptible to this because they're longer. They're longer, and we are hearing acts over time. So it takes time for you to perceive pitch. You've got to get a read on it. You've got to you've got to listen to it a little bit and then you say, "Oh, it's that pitch." Therefore, longer waves that move slower, it's more subtle. So it's not that it's not there, it's just more subtle. It's difficult for us to get. Shorter waves um, like little it's a bitsy waves they happen a lot faster and it's easier for us to pick up on now the other thing that's important is how fast the amplitude is changing if the amplitude changes really fast a whole lot meaning a, a big so it, it gets louder really fast we'll perceive an amplitude change we'll perceive a pitch change because it's more noticeable it happened faster and it was a bigger change so it's, it's just easier to pick out now this is just sine waves now this this change right here we're going from no sound to sudden sound so that's also why you've never ever heard a sine wave if it's ever stopped if it's ever started or ended, it has to have had high frequency allow it to change its amplitude and therefore you do not actually hear that pitch you heard a variation on that pitch. You've never actually heard a true sine wave because you would have to be listening to it forever. So it's a blessing in disguise. Now, if you have, now, if, if you are very knowledgeable on this topic, please drop like your knowledge down below. It's interesting to get the more accurate, more defined ways of saying this. But for our purposes, we have enough information to now move on and understand how this can affect our listening. So if I want to get rid of that subtle little pitch change at the beginning, here it's a little more obvious. I had a little de-clicking filter on. You can come in here and turn on a filter, uh, turn on a volume envelope. So now our volume envelope will turn on over time. And it's easier to, uh, the pitch, the little whoa, whoa goes away. There's still a little bit of one. And you can also, lower frequencies can also do this as well, but your sine wave is a single tone. So therefore, if a tone below it comes in, it doesn't work. It's gotta be higher. It's actually, the more I think about it, and I don't have enough math training, but I believe it's a whole spectrum that comes in to help it, but it's like outside the audible range. So this is a weird deal about how all frequencies must exist for any one frequency to exist. Otherwise, they wouldn't exist. It's like a philosophy sort of thing. So to, basically, if you want to get rid of that pitch band, you make it longer. Now, how does this apply to, how does this become more serious? Well, we've been looking at single tones. Let's step our game up, unfortunately, and look at... A entire wave of tones. So here we've got our fundamental, which is the loudest. Now, if you don't know what this is in Citrus, Citrus has an additive synthesizer capability. Yeah, you can go learn about it on my Citrus from the Ground Up series. And each frequency, each individual frequency is represented right here. So this is our fundamental wave. So that's our fundamental wave. And then each one of these is the following harmonics. I'm expecting you to know this from my Sound and Synth Basics series. So each one of these waves represents the amplitude of these harmonics. The higher up the bar is, the louder that, that particular frequency is in our spectrum. And it generates a saw wave. So what's interesting about this is we notice that our high frequency content is much, much softer than our low frequency content. Now, what does that mean according to this? Well, we know that each one of these is actually a sine wave. So it is all susceptible to the rules we just talked about. Meaning that this lower wave, as we move it, uh, according to the pitch that you're playing, so if you're playing a higher note, this pitch is actually relative to the note you hit. It will be. It will respond differently to the 
to the pitch change, how perceptible that change is. So this, this is part of the timbre, though. We are used to hearing this with instruments. It's why a piano sounds like a piano. It's also why plucked instruments that you hit them, they, they happen so fast that you don't have enough time to get a good read on them. And then when you do have enough time to get a good read on them, you can hear pitch changes very easily. And it's so because it's happening on a spectrum and they're all changing amplitude at different rates, then higher frequencies could be really loud and percussive stuff. It, it makes it like nearly impossible. So your brain freaks out and says it doesn't have a pitch. It's like crazy. It's everywhere. So the drums and stuff are, are really an entirely separate topic that like it's crazy because they this phenomenon goes on making it nearly impossible to lock on to pitch and a number of other ones. But if the low tones stick out enough, if they're loud enough, like for example in toms, you can tune them, but they have a, a bend at the end. But it's for other reasons. Well, it kind of is the the fact that the tom decays over time is also contributing to the pitch bend as well. So it's, it's just a really cool, interesting thing. But that's not what I want to talk about here. So as we do this, if I were to, for example, turn the volume up as this as a whole, this, these ones would suffer the most because they're the loudest and would experience the biggest amplitude change. The higher frequencies are shorter, so they're technically more noticeable, but they're also way, way, way softer, and they stay proportionally softer relative to this. So it, they are actually less noticeable. However, consider if you put a filter on here. Let's say you had a filter that caused these frequencies to be emphasized and these frequencies to be emphasized is a multiband filter like say maximus for example you multiband split it so that your highs were interpreted separately from your lows so if you're a high contents changing volume while your low is staying the same you're going to get an entirely new timbre because that's the beauty of multiband effects the you can change what parts of your signal are affected and therefore you change the overall perception as a whole so you might be saying, this explains why multibands sound the way they do. It explains why certain compressors sound the way they do. Because in a compressor, once it hits the threshold, it turns the entire signal down by some amount according to your ratio. Well, that's, that's going on right here. And it sounds different according to the rate at which it turns it down, how it turns it down, which frequencies it attenuates, the type of filter it's using. There's like so much here. I can like not even give you like the beginning of how much there is here. But it's all based that a lot of the color comes from this this is not all of it's based on there there's a lot of other things that are going on here but the basic concept well i guess i would call this the ground level concept the color of a thing is how it changes this the envelope that it generates for each part of each individual sine wave on its way to its destination pitch it's like it so i mean like hopefully you've just had your mind blown if you haven't uh, I hope you understood it. If you did understood it, then you maybe you already knew about this. But distortion effects change the amplitude of sine waves, changing the perceived pitch, which is a which is a thing. And these pitch changes. Now we need to talk about perception real quick. And I didn't cover this in the other ones. You can perceive a change in pitch of about one seventeenth. I believe it's relative to a to the next note up. So a so a half step on the musical scale. I believe that's how it was measured in the book that I was reading. So about a 17th. So if the pitch changes below that, you won't perceive it anyways. But you will perceive an overall shift in timbre. And so as a result, and especially since the timbre is going to be changing, because remember, in real life, everything's changing subtly. So there's just all, there's just, there's just so much to talk about. So compressors, that's why they sound the way they do. Things that are static, though, like EQs, do not have this. But, um, but well, okay, they do, but for a different reason. So compressors are actively pushing the signal up and down. Multiband compressors are pushing parts of your signal up and down, changing the pitch subtly there, giving it different colors. And that's why analog gear is so cool. These non-linearities, meaning that they don't do the same thing every time. They've got some randomization to them. So what make them sound so organic, because that's the way things are in real life for a number of other reasons. And then uh, you bet you didn't expect sound waves to get this freaking crazy, dude. Me neither. Uh, then you have things like, what was it? E oh, yeah, EQ. That's what I was talking about. Okay. In EQ. If you apply a cut here, the spectrum comes in, though, and if your signal is a changing signal, it's not a static one, it's going to therefore have different, the content hitting right here, the frequencies will be the same, but they are changing amplitude relative to this envelope, so you are effectively coloring your signal, changing the relative amplitude, and you are also messing with the pitch of that signal. But that, uh, so... 
Yeah, and then you get into phase shifts and things that filters do to that. And so this is just something you need to tuck away in your toolkit for why things sound the way they do when you're making choices. When you hear weird pitch changes, you may be able to pinpoint it and actually link it to this phenomenon. That's why certain things sound the way they do. And now you know why non uh, things that are modeled after instruments, like for example, this plugin right here, or the uh, 76, uh, that's why they sound the way they do and why people want to model them and why it's important and why sound waves sound, you know, different, why something that increases. Now, we're going to be talking about other things in the future, but I'm sort of, I'm going on a rambling little thing right here. So I'm all done. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I hopefully you've understood it. Subscribe and have a blessed day to get a kick to sit. So let's just say you have X kick. This is a good kick. So let's just put down four beats of a kick. So I'm going to use the magic of multiband compression with the combination of sort of amplitude remapping. I'm going to be using Maximus. I've tried covering other plugins here.